welcome back to our first Dallas Starts Organization International Tai Chi Roundtable discussion. For this discussion, we've got three great practitioners, Ken Gullett of internalfightingarts.com, Ronnie Yi, and Chris Marshall of Shoreline Tai Chi. And you've seen all three of these guests on our program previously. Um, Chris and Ronnie have been on twice, and it's Ken's third time appearing on the podcast and we brought them all together to share their thoughts on their Tai Chi practice, the current state of Tai Chi, um, the future of Tai Chi Chuen, uh, public perception, and several other topics relating to the art. Uh, it was a great discussion. Um, it, it was great to get all these guys together in one place and, and hear their thoughts and watch them interact with each other. And we're looking forward to doing it again. If you'd like to join in the discussion yourself by adding your opinions and thoughts in the comments section, we'd be happy to see those. We try to respond to all of your comments. Um, hope you enjoy it. Thanks for watching, and don't forget to hit like and subscribe. All right, everybody, welcome to the Dowie Tai Chi Roundtable. Uh, we'll start off by having everybody briefly introduce themselves. Ken, why don't you go first? Uh, I'm Ken Gullett. I teach uh, Chen Tai Chi, Xing Yi, and Bagua in uh, the Quad Cities uh, on the border of Iowa and Illinois. Okay. Ronnie? I am Ronnie Yi, and I teach also teach Chen Tai Chi, uh, in particular the Hong method, the practical method. And I live in Regina, of Saskatchewan. If no one knows where that is, it's the right in the middle of uh, Canada, right above... I guess my not for the U.S. people. North Dakota. Okay. And Chris Marshall. Yes, I am Chris Marshall. I am a sixth generation Yang style teacher and the founder of Shoreline Tai Chi in Seattle. Okay, great. So we've got a Chen versus Yang lineup <laughs> today. All right. Excellent. So we're, we're just here to talk about some general, um, you know, topics that, uh, concern the Tai Chi community and, and things that we all have personal interests in. But before we get into the actual nitty gritty questions, I just wanted to ask everybody, what is it that makes Tai Chi unique or what is it? I know that all of you have studied multiple martial arts. Um, what is it that attracts you to Tai Chi? What is it that makes you makes it unique? And uh, Chris, we'll, we'll start with you on that. <laughs> um, sure. You know, I might redirect this question just a little bit, because even though all four of us have significant experience in other martial arts, I think that perhaps many of the people watching this uh, may not have a basis of comparison between Tai Chi and other martial arts. Good point. And so, you know, a lot has been said about the uniqueness of Tai Chi by people who have never done anything else and don't necessarily know that that's the case. So I might just throw out one or two ideas about things that don't make Tai Chi unique just to be a uh, stick in the mud this morning. <clears throat> uh, the combination of fast and slow movement, not unique to Tai Chi. Everybody does that, to be honest. If you look, consider the combination of drills and low impact flow sparring, whatever else, everybody does that. Importance of relaxation. Nobody thinks it's better to be tense than to be relaxed in any martial art in the whole universe. Uh, and maybe, you know, the one thing that gets discussed so much, the internal status of Tai Chi is also not even unique to Tai Chi. There's at least three other martial arts that say they're internal as well. So these are things that, in, in my mind, don't make Tai Chi unique. I, I wonder if anybody else has a, a perspective on that. Ken, you want to weigh in on that? Um, no, I don't have much argument with that at all. I think what makes Tai Chi unique is, uh, I think it it employs a, generally a, a unique set of body mechanics that allow you to stay relaxed and yet structured when force is coming in. Uh, and that's my, also my favorite part of it. Um, tai Chi is best when it's hands-on, not standing four feet away. Um, that's why we do push hands. But yeah, I think the body mechanics are unique, uh, at least in some aspects of some styles of Tai Chi. Not all. The mechanics will differ from 
one style to the next, one teacher to the next. But I studied uh, Yang style for a while before I got into Chen and found uh, radically different body mechanics that, that appealed to me a lot better. So that's one of the unique things. I I think there are at least at least one teacher I had didn't really understand internal, I don't believe. But uh, yeah, that's, that's my thought. Okay, Ronnie? If I can throw one more thing just on top of what you just said, Ken, I think that the unique body skills that we see in Tai Chi are in part a consequence of the importance we place on solo training and therefore provide ourselves the opportunity to develop those skills. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I absolutely agree with uh, both uh, Chris and Ken here. It's uh, that was that was a great description and, and comparison. Um, personally, for me, it's uh, of course like we just said, we all have done other arts and uh, systems. Um, person for me, it's because of it's this. You can say, like how Chris says, we have, there's always uh, the underlying, you know, technique or, or applications all it crosses over. Uh, tai Chi is more just a pursuit of, of efficiency. It's a shape. It doesn't matter what style of Tai Chi. It's more central based. Where Bagua Circle, Xing Yi, more blasting through. I'm just generalizing. Generalizing. Sorry, if I know I'm, <laughs> I'm insulting anyone, but. Uh, but Tai Chi, is, it's more central based, and uh, particularly, I would say, I say in, in Chen style, the the, the spirals, it's um, more conformed to even more closer to the dot without where everything spins out of the dot. It's uh, the efficiency of how to use complete central um, equilibrium, right? If it's even slightly like this, or it moves around. And just just because I'm quite lazy in motion, we've done lots of arts, and we want to become efficient as we get older and longevity. We don't want to hurt ourselves in bigger motions, right? And more external motions. Yes, like how Ken says, uh, recalibration of internal mechanics, which is what we love. Um, we we just get that joy out of that little tiny incremental motion, right? Which works amazingly well for a big big motion. Which again. Going back to the cliche of uh, stillness and motion and motion and stillness, right? We, the less we move and we can affect more, um, um, we'll say, let's say opponent-wise, um, more application-based, where we can affect your opponent more without any emotion or make them react and so forth, right? Yeah. Okay, now I'm offended. <laughs> Finally. Okay. So, you know, we talked about a little bit about the internal and, and internal mechanics and things like that. And, and this next question kind of depends on what your definitions are, but how important is the concept of chi to Tai Chi? Ronnie, would you like to speak on that? Sure, of course, this term gets thrown out as a blanket term for internal power and so forth, but that's very subjective, right? We all know this. And someone says, yeah, chi, and you can feel the warmth in hand. That's just... We can say that's just blood going to the fingertips or you feel great when you practice and you feel chi or this lightness about you. Um, my take on, on it is, you know, the, of course, we all know the six harmonies, the, four, the three internal harmonies, the, the intent, spirits, and chi. I say chi is, my take on it is, it's the, it's a life force. It's everything that gives, uh, gives everything life in our universe. It's how we're alive, how something is dead, but it has chi, it's, there's life in it. You can see when someone walks into a room, there's you can feel there's more life, there's negative chi, and so forth, right? Chi always exists, but we are hindering it. As soon as we're, let's say a baby is uh, born, you can say, oh, it's full of chi, it's 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 uh, vibrant, it's fresh, and right? It's There's no um, tightness in the body, we'll say. As we get older, there's all this tightness. We have this, we try to do a system of martial arts. We try to bring out chi. And so it kind of actually blocks it, I feel. So as we get, as we train in our systems, right? Whatever system it is, we're actually subtracting. We're, re, re, we're going back to the beginning, but with a mind intent skill, right? Because a baby can't do that. It doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't have the, the thinking part yet. The, so as we as we get uh, into our martial art, chi exists. How can we harness it? 
how can we how can we subtract so we come back to the original form of it? So with with spirit and mind intent, this is my take on it again. Um, it's intent first. So I'm doing a, I'm doing form. I'm doing a motion. I have this intent to do an application or or body mechanic. Then you know as you get better at it, it becomes automatic. We you say that person has spirit when they're doing it. Right? It looks amazing. And how how are they moving like that? And it's just power, and they can apply it so well without any emotion. Then I would say cheese, the last thing, because once you're, once the intention is there, the spirit is there, you can say, I just move, I can move transcendently. It's just, that's, I have chi. It's like you can compare it to uh, someone who's great at uh, music, singing. When they are that level, that, that looks like it's, there's so much high spirit there. That's chi flowing through without any hindrance. Chris, thought on that? importance of chi okay now now we're getting into topics that we can start to argue about for real <laughs> great uh you know this is absolutely a core question and the way i like to dodge this question <laughs> is just by talking about how the early generation taiji masters looked at chi and so i start off by sharing references to the literature and i think i'll share two of those now <clears throat> Firstly, starting uh, from Zhang Manqing, who was one of the most one and who was and is one of the most influential Taiji writers uh, in history. And if you look at uh, his book, which he ghost wrote for Yang Cheng Fu, he says something that is received as quite paradoxical. He says, "When I met Yang Cheng Fu, I finally learned the importance of not." Using qi, not using qi. And, you know, people read this and they say, well, it's got to be a misprint. It's got to be a typo. He didn't know what he was talking about, or let's just ignore it. But this is what he said uh, in black and white. And <clears throat> if we look more broadly at the literature that was generated uh, in the early 20th century when Tai Chi was really starting to go public and uh, early generation masters were looking to impart at least some of their wisdom uh, onto their future students. You know, you can look at the topics that they considered to be important because again, it's written right down in the manuals. And uh, fortunately, you know, with the internet these days, we've got many, if not most of those manuals uh, now uh, available to us in English. So we have no excuse not to look it up. And when we look at those manuals, we see pages and pages and pages talking about how to locate your arms and your legs and your trunk and how to move them from one position to the next. And we see actually very little discussion of chi. It's almost the polar opposite of what modern students would like Tai Chi to be. Yeah, that's a good point. And can I... Um, you particularly uh, have a very scientific uh, outlook on life. Uh, what, what's your take on this? Is 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 chi or is the maybe it's maybe maybe the question is is that what the public thinks of chi is that important to Tai Chi? I don't know. Let let, let me hear your thoughts on that. Well, I think what the public thinks of chi is not that different from Tai Chi. Yeah. They think of the metaphysical near supernatural things and uh, uh, kind of uh, separate from reality a little bit. I think you can talk about chi in so many different ways from a cultural perspective. And China is just, it's just there. Yeah. And it can mean breath. It can mean the flow of life through your body. Um, I, I talked with two men who have spent decades going to Taiwan, and Bill, you've talked to them too, I believe, uh, Tim Cartmel and Dan Miller. And Tim Cartmel says she never comes up in his classes. It's body mechanics. And, and it never comes up in the classes you take in Taiwan or China when they are good fighters. Right. When they use it as martial art. So 
I mean, I, I do sometimes when I get a new student in and they ask about it, I say, okay, let me demonstrate chi flow. And I get in a good structure. I have them push on me and I ground it. I say, let me show you no chi flow. And I collapse my arm and, and they take me pretty easily. See, there's a difference there. You've got structure. You're using the internal mechanics and line up and here you're not using any of that intent. So yeah, I, I agree. look at it more realistically. Yeah, I agree with that too. And I mean, um, you know, Ken Fish, I was talking to him once and he said that when he was growing up in Taiwan, he said martial arts were like baseball was in the United States in the same time period. Nobody was talking about chi. You just, you did these movements and things worked. But of course, you know, like what I think what Ronnie was saying too is that a lot of this, like when you, we talk about chi as spirit or like passion or intensity or something like that, it's like the difference between a guitar player who's technically proficient, but it's just very cold and unenjoyable to listen to as opposed to somebody that's like really putting their intent and their spirit into it. So I guess it really just depends on the definition. And, it, and of course, chi, like you said, Ken's got a lot of definitions culturally. Mm -hmm. um, this kind of leads nicely into my next question. Here we can get into some darker waters. Uh, <laughs> When we talk about things like chi and, and 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 sometimes people from outside the martial arts world or who are just getting into the martial arts world or people in the martial arts world who might not be entirely scrupulous, we started to hear about these miraculous things that can happen. Um, most of those things can be explained by physics or at least uh, you know touched on by physics. Something that we see a lot, especially on YouTube nowadays, is is what some people term hopping. So when people are like pushing hands you'll see usually the student uh, will be, you know, thrown backwards or they will hop backwards uh, uh, when the instructor is pushing on them. And I've seen this, we've all seen it, we've all probably experienced it on our own. And, and there are some funky things that happen when you're pushing hands, some, some weird things happen to your body when you're pushing hands with somebody that really knows what they're doing right. Some things that you in, initially cannot explain yourself. But there's a controversy because we see a lot of the stuff on YouTube and some of it looks very fake and that there's just a lot of um, armchair warrior debate. So we might as well join the other armchair warriors and throw our own two cents in here. Um, what about the hoppers, Chris? What, 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 what do you think about them? What, what's this all sure. about? Uh, so let me start by saying that uh, I've written at some length on this topic. Anybody uh, watching this can type in this is why we hop in Tai Chi into Google, uh, and you'll get a uh, very a thorough answer. But <clears throat> to summarize it, you know, people fake things which are valuable. People don't fake things with no value. Right. So there's a long history in Tai Chi of people, let's say, being made to hop and it not being faked. Right. And because people can see this and on some subconscious level interpret it as being, oh, very interesting. For that reason, people will fake it. And yes, there's a lot of faking going on. Yes, absolutely. Okay, Ronnie. So, um, yes, what, we have all experienced the, we've all taken martial arts from so not high level people. And so we, when we first started, and it, you do feel that magic where you just get thrown out with any without any effort. Yeah. And over time, as we've, a practice we've gotten to a higher skill level we can kind of kind of uh, um, explain it through our you know we've, we've gotten more skilled there's mechanics there's physics sure there's lots of internal uh, recalibration going on and uh, so you can go well I I can now sort of I'm not be, we're not being boastful but we can now achieve what that person can do when I, we first met them 30 years ago 20 years ago we have that ability skill level may, may not to be the same but close to it. So I think when, let's say when I just go to his two halves to this, right? Is that when we're, when we can do it to a student, legitimately do it and you can feel the, the fight and you can, you can recalibrate, dissipate energy and resend it back and un, unroop, unroop somebody. And just that perfect point where people get thrown out using their own power. And that's just, just amazing. So some students, they grab onto that Right. And we as teachers, we do the same. And that's the problem. So we're trying to give the students connection. So we kind of lock out or we frame out our body and then connect so they can feel the, the ground path. 
So we bounce ourselves out. That was good. And we do the same. We throw them out do the same thing. But over time, it's almost like, I won't call it brainwashing. You just get used to it. Then some people get so used to it, as long as they feel that connection, they'll jump themselves. And I have, I, have a, I think I did one, William, the podcast I did last month. I talked about this. I did a workshop in Ottawa where I was working with a Wing Chun guy. And he and I didn't, I know I didn't do anything. He just jumped 10 feet back, right? And I, he came back, I go, I whispered in his ear. I, I, I feel him uh, reset and ready to launch. I go, stop it right now. <laughs> I whispered in his ear, like, don't do it. And he, he re he's ready to jump, right? He's he's powering up, like, don't do it. I like, fight back. You need to counter this so other students can see what I'm doing and mechanics of it and so forth, right? And as, reverse it. As a teacher, I did this to my students at one point. He goes, Ronnie, you need to stop this. I'm not learning anything. <laughs> you need to put a lot more pressure on me so I can learn how to manipulate the power and how to ground myself. So <laughs> back and forth. Yes, there's, there's that controversy we see on YouTube where people get jumped. I'm sure these people, these teachers have skill, but their students are now teaching. That's, that's why you see the the, 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 the fights with, with uh, you know, people jumping against MMA. Well, I'm sure we're going to get into that in a moment. <laughs> but uh, where. The student actually believes they can do that. Where, yeah. where students are bouncing off of them, they go, I must be that good. Right. So and that's a that's a definitely the, the negative side of it. Um, so we gotta we gotta be really aware and be realistic, of course. Um that's all I can say about that. Yeah. <laughs> good points. Chen, you wanna weigh in on that? I take I don't know. I I would like to give a lot of these guys a roundhouse kick to the head. Uh, yeah, I've seen you do that. <laughs> I mean, uh, it was 21 years ago this fall that I had seen an article in Inside Kung Fu, you know, is no touch chi power real. And the article said yes, because it was written by the student of a master. I challenged him $5,000. If you can make me do this, I will give you the money on the spot. And it's 21 years later and not one person. And I've asked some of the guys who make their students hot to do that on me. And no one will do it. But there's a difference in getting a student in the right position and applying pressure so that they fall back or, or step back and try to get their balance than a student hopping like away like a rabbit. And it, I just have no patience for it. I think it's dishonest on the part of the student and the teacher. And if you, yeah, I just don't think it really can be done. Fair enough. So, you know, you know I had an interesting experience in DC uh, where I was attending the Kuoshu uh, two or three weeks ago with one of my students. <clears throat> and I, I met up with a number of great guys, but, you know, they, uh, by and large, they have a very similar viewpoint to what we're airing right here about hopping, which is that uh, you can't make anybody hop, you know, it's not realistic. And so I, I engaged with one of them and I immediately made him hop. <laughs> <laughs> Just immediately. This guy's well known for saying that nobody can make you hop. I immediately made him hop. And I, I want the guy, he's he a perfectly hop? good guy. Sorry? How far did he hop and how many? <laughs> well, it was two feet, but it was my choice. How many feet? There was a wall over there. So come on, let's be reasonable. But, um, <clears throat> you know, it's unfortunate that the Tai Chi community at large is sort of missing the opportunity to discuss the how of hopping at a technical and strategic level and just discussing whether it can be done or not. Get everybody in a room. Either you can make them do it or not, but if you can make them do it, then we can discuss, let's say, why it matters, which is more, I think, germane to students. Yeah, it, it seems to have almost become like a uh, a selling point for people that are new to Tai Chi, whether or not an, an instructor can make them hop. And then some of these guys that are out there, like Ken was saying, you've got people where they're sort of like hopping around the room like rabbits, and it's almost goes right in what Ronnie was saying it's it's all in some cases it is malicious chicanery I mean there's no question about that but in other cases it's a question of 
the teacher is conditioning the student, whether consciously or subconsciously, and the student is conditioning the teacher, whether consciously or subconsciously. And I, I see the same thing, uh, not to bash Aikido, but I've seen this thing happen in Aikido schools a lot too. If a good Aikido teacher throws you, they can throw you, they can make you go in the direction that, that you've seen these Aikidos throw go, but a student, in order to avoid bodily damage, will fall in the direction that the throw is going, and eventually that creates the situation where the student and the teacher are conditioning each other, where these, you know, no touch throws and things of that nature happen. And it, I think ultimately gives the art a really bad name. Just I think you can... oh, sorry, one more thing. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Ken. You know, we're adults. We, uh, I, I assume everybody here at some point in their life has gotten into a fight. You know what it feels like anyway, if you can, if you train pe with people. Oh, lost Ken. Lost Ken somehow. <laughs> uh oh. Well, he he broke on. the rules and got kicked off I Zoom. Cut, I, cut, I cut his mic. <laughs> oh, <laughs> new style. Oh, no. Let me see if we can get him back here. He actually <clears throat> turned himself off. Well, I don't want to get kicked off too. Hopping is great. All hopping is real. Okay, please let me stay. Huh. Yeah, we're all safe here. Happened. Dude. Sorry, as, we're, well, as we're bringing Ken back, I'd like to say one, just one little point. I know it's um for because a lot of students, especially workshops and in, amongst your own students, you want to respect your teacher, so you you. You, yeah, you, absolutely. Right. So you're bouncing for the sake of making that your school look good or your teacher look good. And and sometimes um, that all go, of course, we know goes overboard. Right. And I've done it. I'm I'm guilty 100 percent of it where you want to make your teacher look good in front of a big group and you want to make your school right respectful. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. yeah here, sorry, sorry, Ken, I had to cut your mic there. You're getting a little a little rowdy. <laughs> I think I had a chi surge. To, uh, <laughs> not what, sorry, what were you saying? Well, we know the strength it takes to knock a person back. Yeah. And even if it doesn't appear we're doing a lot, we know force has to come in in order for us to send it back. And what where I have a problem with it, uh, I had my experience with Chen Shao Xing, where I was I stepped at him and I found myself on my back and had no idea how he did that. And it was a simple thing of pressing my leg to get my shoulder to turn and then helping that shoulder turn more. Uh, but it took me several times to understand that. But when I see someone touching someone so light and the guy's not moving and suddenly they're jumping back, you know that that's not real. You know the force it takes. And, and what, people say, well, he knocked him back 10 feet in the air. Well, do you know how much force that takes to knock a, an adult 10 feet in the air? None of us have ever done it, I don't think. I've done it. 10 feet in the air back. Yeah. Without yeah. hitting the ground. <laughs> you hit the ground eventually. <laughs> But yeah, I mean, your your point is valid that you require something close to ideal circumstances. You need the other person to do the exact wrong thing when you do the exact right thing. And then they really got to go. And yeah. there's no, you know, you can, you can govern your own conduct, but you can't force somebody to do the exact wrong thing. That is their choice. All right. I, I would uh, ask too often. Yeah, I would just love for you to, I would love to see a video with 10 feet measured out and someone going back in the air that far from sure. being, that's the way to do it. And I want well, to see you how know, you do your practice run and then you want them to do the same thing again and they never do the same thing again. No, <laughs> different. Right. So it's all, it's all relative too, right? It's like you, you, if you take someone who's a beginner and you're a much higher level, it, it looks like you're just magical, right? Yeah. When two players are the same level and very cautious, just kind of just 
bounces back and forth and you both look like you don't know much, right? Because you're both doing the same thing and you're both at that level. So it's all relative also. Yeah, I agree. So, you know, I guess we're kind of going like on a straight path with this when we talk about these sorts of things, uh, you know, like Chris was saying, you have the person has to do the exact, way, exact wrong thing and you have to be in the position to do the exact right thing. And with Tai Chi, um, in, in all internal martial arts, we have some forms of pressure testing. And, you know, in Tai Chi, the most common form of pressure testing is push hands. But there are other forms of pressure testing, too. I mean, you, you know, there are people that practice Tai Chi as a martial art where you have a person like actively trying to you know, take you down or what whatnot. And um, I, I just wanted to ask the question of each of you. How important is pressure testing to Tai Chi, uh, like to the integrity of the art? What constitutes pressure testing? Um, Ken, would you like to answer that first? Um, I think it's important on any martial art. Um, and one of the ways I have tried to do this is invite other martial artists of other styles into my uh, practices and r roll a video and say, take me down. Just take me down and see how they do that. and And then try to respond with Tai Chi principles and methods and mechanics to instead take them down and use their, uh, manage their center in a way that I can uh, attempt that. So that's how I try to pressure test. And with my own students, we don't cooperate all the time. And they, they uh, that's a good thing. Yeah, I agree. It's necessary, or at least I think it is. Ronnie, what do you think? Oh, definitely. It's so important, especially if you're doing it Tai Chi as a martial art, you have to be pressure tested. And, and it has to be applied to like any martial art incrementally depends on the person's skill level, right? It's easy, it's, as, as, as instructors as we are, we can, we, we do, I don't care how you look at it. There's points where you've done workshops and you've got pressure tested in amongst your own students or people have come in to challenge you. You do get a bit of a, we'll call it a glitch, but you learn how to maybe calibrate and you get better. That's how we get better. We, we don't, we're not magically sitting up here. So pressure testing is utmost important. Um, this is how you, um, you validate every motion. And, but if you can, if you can take your basic fundamentals of dissipation, ground power, expansion, and so forth, and like how Chris says, the angles, and you get the right person, right place, and right time, um, that's just pure precision. You're always, and we're cutting hairs now, right? We, you might be this good, and then you cut a hair, right? You, you, go, you cut it right down the center and in quarters. We're getting to that point where we're just right in the middle of that space, being able to, right in a teeter-totter space, right in a dot. So being pressure testing, yes, it looks chaotic at first and but it looks magical when you can get the tai chi principles will say into that spot like a headlock or even a takedown or something very chaotic right a punch um but that's where we we i think as internal martial arts especially tai chi people where we get the most joy out of that, that just getting that little bit every time so yeah chris uh, let me share a short anecdote and then circle around to the question. So before I got professionally involved in Tai Chi, uh, I had a career as a software engineer. And testing is extremely important in software engineering. You know, we might build an individual software module, test it extensively, stick another module on top of that, test the new subsystem, add more, test it again, get an end user involved, test again in a different way, <clears throat> put it under some uh, extreme environmental conditions and test it again. So much testing, testing is fundamental. And if you were uh, interviewing an engineer and you said, you know, how do you test your stuff? And they said, well, we pressure test it at the end or even in the middle, you'd say, thank you very much for your time. Don't hire this guy. It's no good. 
so this idea of pressure testing, actually, it drives me crazy because it typically seems to imply that testing is something you do near the end by getting somebody else involved and just see whether it, it works or not. Uh, whether it works is really the lowest level of testing. And, <clears throat> you know, when I was learning Tai Chi for, I don't know, the third or fourth or fifth time, depending on how you count it out, there were so many involved, it really would boggle your mind. And this is before you ever touch anybody, just in the performance of the form and how you carry your body, dozens of tests. And if you can't pass those tests, let's just say the teacher's satisfaction, there's no point uh, of doing push hands or trying to apply on some other martial artist. You've already failed because you haven't got the gung fu. And so pressure testing is, of course, very important, but I would like to see Tai Chi take its rightful place in leading other martial arts and demonstrating how to test what we've accomplished and not sort of chasing behind them and saying, I wish we were, were as good as, you know, the strip mall MMA school. That's a great point. It's a good outlook. I, if you don't mind, I, I think the, the Lei Tai that you had mentioned earlier, I think that's a really good way to pressure test. Um, we don't have a platform, but we have a, you know, we mark off a square. Okay, if you can get me out of that, you win. And uh, I have a 300 pound student who can get me out of that <laughs> ring, but it's a nice way to pressure test. You know, late, I realized over the past 30 some years, I really haven't been very good at fighting with Bagua, using it in self defense. And so, in the last few weeks, my students and I have been doing what we did with Tai Chi in a way, you start with slow contact flow type of movements um, and you go with it at both at the same speed, you defend and attack. And you do that with Bagua applications and Bagua techniques and uh, spiraling and the wrapping and the coiling. Uh, and you get faster and faster until you've got one guy feeding you punches and you're using Bagua to defend and strike back. And that's one way that we try to pressure test it among ourselves to the point where you, you start free flowing and it's not programmed and you don't know what the attacker is going to do. That's a good drill. So where does competition come into this? For I, I know, I'm, I'm, Ronnie, I'm not sure about you, but I, I know Chris and Ken competed quite a bit. Um, is competition, uh, is that important as, as pressure testing? Yes, um, definitely to a certain degree because there's no compl complacency, right? Being that this person in front of you is going to do this, <laughs> it's trying to take you out. Yeah. So again, Go back to what even uh, Chris and Ken said, depends on your objective, right? So let's say, turn it, let's say we're, we're talking about competition right now. Um, I have um, pushed hands, I've competed in China in 96 in the early 90s against uh, the one of the top of the top guys in China, right? I walked into the room, their legs are the size of my waist. <laughs> right? So I was like, what is this happening? I don't even know how to push hands that well. And I just, he just tossed me to the walls. But I'll tell you that I'll give, I'll tell you right now at the time when I, in 1991 when I was pushing out some of the, the top guys in China, um, I'm thinking this isn't this doesn't feel to, like in my mind to what Tai Chi is like that soft and you, you magical motion right this guy's tearing my shirt off almost and I'm and his I'm tearing his shirt off as I'm pulling down but yet he's supposed to be the world's best right and so getting back to that i felt even at the time i thought oh my high school buddy who wrestle can probably take this guy right so not putting it down of course it's evolved now people have gotten better at tai chi and mechanics and so forth and um so in competition wise the objective of course depends on you so one step is it just freestyle free flowing um it trains a certain 
aspect of it, that initial interception, we'll say, right? It's not a finishing. We can't, we can't say you're finishing the person on the ground or anything like that or knocking them out. It, but the initial being able to dissipate force, take it, um, all those mo things are happening all at once inside that little pocket, right? And I think it's very important to just for that initial initial contact and to play and, and dissipate and get out of that situation. Uh, but to be continuous, um, because competition is like, well, if this happened, there's a point, you have to stop. And again, nothing wrong with that. It's great. I think every aspect of it, whatever you can build competition wise, free flowing, freestyle, um, if it goes right to the ground, it, every aspect of it, incrementally, it grows your Tai Chi. But again, um, I have nothing bad to say about it. It's a it's a great place. It's a great um, stage to to develop a certain aspect of your Tai Chi. I agree. And I think forms competition actually comes into that too a little bit. I think that can be seen as a form of pressure testing um, in a way. Uh, Chris, you are famously uh, into competition. Let's hear your thoughts on this. Yeah. And, you know, I have a lot of bad things I could say about competition, but I want to focus on what's important, which is that overall it's a good thing. And it's more than a good thing. It really is essential. <clears throat> it's not optional. It's essential. And when I say it's essential, I don't mean that you need to go to a large public tournament and put on a show in front of judges and then try to get a medal. That's one form of competition. But if we're being frank and honest here, push hands is 100% competition. You're trying to get the other person to do something they don't want to do. Right. They're trying to do the same to you. This is competition. And, uh, you know, to the extent that early masters said that push hands was essential for Tai Chi and you can't understand it otherwise, they're saying that you have to compete. It's, just, it's same meaning, different words. Uh, Ken, yeah, I, I love competition. I, unfortunately, by the time I was felt like I could have competed in Tai Chi tournaments for push hands, I lost a lung and got to the age where it wasn't quite as feasible. Um, so, but I did compete a lot and I would take my internal forms into open competitions with other styles. And I just thought it was a great way to showcase the art. And especially here in the Midwest, when, where you can do a Bagua form. I didn't get a medal, but I wanted to show it. And I asked the judge afterwards, uh, what did you think? He said, I thought it was cool, but I had no idea what you were doing. <laughs> I said, yeah, I know I, I said, why I did it. So, but, uh, you know, the Xing Yi does really well, even against karate and Taekwondo. Chen Tai Chi can, if you put the Fa Jin right uh, throughout the movements, the, they, it wakes them up. But, uh, yeah, forms competition, sparring. Uh, I, I really believe the sparring competition, even if it's not, even if it's regular tournament sparring, uh, punching and kicking can prepare you mentally for strategies you would need in a self-defense situation. When you have someone trained trying to hit you and kick you and you can successfully take advantage of his weaknesses to hit and kick him, uh, I think that helps overall. Yeah, I agree. And I think that, you know, just the psychological aspect of competition is really important for a correct mindset. You know, it's like they say that the number one fear is of public speaking and number two is death. You know, <laughs> if you're afraid to compete, you're probably not going to fare too well in an actual fight. And it really tells you a lot about yourself. I have had students who won loss in a tournament and they quit martial arts. But uh, the the ones who are meant for martial arts look at that defeat and say, how can I get better? And they continue to work at it until they do. That's that's the whole point, right? Good lesson. 
Yeah, it depends on the objective of the of your school, right? If it's just forms and 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 health and, and rejuvenation, great. If you're talking about as a martial art, and we say we all know this, there's schools that are people are very delusional, where they're good at one trick pony motions and push hands, where they're just it's awesome. You just do this to me every time. Like you feed me this power, and I can throw you across the room. But yeah, like like Chris says, it's essential that pressure testing, and then like Willem, you said, it's that psychology of it. You you gotta go into the fire. If you don't feel that, you're you're you're, you're going to get delusional. You think you're you're going to back to the, what we said earlier. You're going to be one of those people that just touch people, and you, my students fly away, and that's I'm that good. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that you know something I tell my Xing Yi students is that yes, you can study Xing Yi for health, but the more you study it like a martial art, which is what it is supposed to be, the healthier you will become. You know that that you you have to practice it as it was intended to reap the full benefits. And I think, you know, pressure testing and competition are, are mm -hmm. on the on the pressure testing and the competition uh, line. Uh, Chris, do you think that the current structures that are in place uh, in competition are are adequate? Do you think that? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> OK, let, let, let me hear your thoughts on this. Um, what, <clears throat> what's sure. something that could be done specifically to improve, like, let's say, push hands? competition structure yeah well let me answer something else and then come to that one so um addressing both this and the and the previous uh question form competition is really challenging because often you don't have any objective standards going in to know how you're going to be judged uh all you know is all you know is that the judge does a different style than you maybe it's a little bit different maybe it's very different and in the absence of objective written standards, it's just going to be, does your form look like mine? Okay, it's good. Does it look different? Oh, not so good. That is really how form competitions uh, are operated in the Tai Chi world. And even that even is the case in my experience when these standards are uh, seemingly objective and written down and distributed in advance. It's still, they're just kind of ignored and does it look like I think it should look, which is to say how mine looks. <laughs> now, that that's it's hard to take Tai Chi seriously when these sort of things are happening at such a high level. Uh, but, you know, my, my guidance to my students has been, well, you can just treat this as a recital and ignore the score at the end. Because, you know, as Ronnie and Ken said, uh, and Bill, you said as well, there's something very valuable, valuable about just being able to get up in front of a crowd and have everybody stare, stare at you and still perform. Yeah. In a strange situation. Or yeah. Environment. yeah. It is. It is extremely stressful. <laughs> um, a number of people, including myself, have found the forum competitions a lot more stressful than the push hands competitions and even more stressful than street fights. <laughs> my first uh, forms competition, weapons forms, as a black belt, I was doing my broadsword form, looked over and a few feet away, a kid was walking through the ring. <laughs> yeah. And I totally lost my train of thought and had to start making up moves to finish the form. <laughs> I, that learned, uh, it taught me a good lesson. Yeah, yeah you don't so... Um, I, I wonder what you guys think think about that aspect of it before we even talk about push hands rules. Uh, you know, what do you think about the importance of providing opportunities for recitals uh, in uh, in Tai Chi? Ronnie, <laughs> I'll, I'll start first. Um, yes, that's would <laughs> definitely. I absolutely agree on uh, forms being, because of course I compete in a lot of forms too, and uh, being much more difficult than the push hands part. <laughs> and uh, because you're, you're every, all eyes are on you, right? First of all, it depends on your level. It's it's choreography, it's balance, right? It, it's like, you know, how back in the day where Wushu is still judged by the, the amount of splits and spins in the air, it doesn't matter the quality. So this is my, this is my kind of argument is that if you have good quality, how do you judge Pung? If Pung is our essence, and if someone has, like, you, if you went to, a, you touch them, they go, this person is amazing. 
and they move less because we know the more you move, the less pung, well, the less pung you have, the less quality you have because it's, it's theatrical. But by the judge's eyes and the audience eyes, that looks really good. You did, you went right down the floor, the snakes creeps down, and you're deep. That wins. But if this person can have great tai chi, like skill wise, and it moves very little. Well, that that's terrible looking. I'm gonna give him a score of four because it doesn't look good. So that's right. different. And of course, as depending on the judges too, right? How how what level are the judges looking uh, watching you? Like some people can watch you. I I heard this before under my grandmaster. He says. I can look at you for, like Feng Jichang was one of them. And he says, uh, if I looked at you for five seconds, you can just walk off the stage because I know how good you are. Just by standing there, you can relax and, and, and ground yourself. But the person who spins and all this stuff, like, get out. You, that should be a zero. I, I, I heard this in the audience when I was sitting in one of the major competitions where somebody who was amazing looking. I thought at the time in the 90s, like, this guy looks amazing. And then the master sitting beside me goes, I'd give him a zero. What? How can it be a zero? This guy's amazing. You know, that guy is good. He's barely moving. How can he be good? But now, today, I can now, fresh eyes, different eyes. Yes, I can see the grounding, see the, the, the rotation and the connection, right? So I don't know if that answers anything, but it's very difficult to judge because, again, based on the judges and what you're looking for. And just getting back to the essence of the question, I guess, it's very important. Yes, it's, it's, it's how can you keep calm in that state while all these eyes are on you? And have you practiced enough? It's like any endeavor. Have you practiced enough to just kind of block out everything and just be, right? And that's when you truly know that person uh, has practice and, and has a skill. I don't think I want to judge anymore at these things. I, I don't know. I, uh, I think we all get clouded by what we think is good Tai Chi or good whatever, but... You know, I judged in a tournament, one of the last ones, and one of my top students was competing against a black belt from a school that really doesn't do the quality, in my opinion. But I scored my black belt lower because I knew what he was trying to accomplish than this guy who did a mediocre form the way he was taught. And it, it was hard for me to get that across to my student but i know what you're trying to do with your quad and i know the the grounding and the spiraling and it didn't happen so yeah and now I, I when i watch people do tai chi and they can even from the very beginning of the of the form if i see them sink and step out and their hip goes yes. i see that they have lost their center from the very beginning it's, right. So it would be hard for me to judge uh, at a tournament, I think. Well, you know, and that's the other aspect of it. <clears throat> we don't have that many opportunities for, I don't know, some sort of regional gathering in Tai Chi. So people go to the same four or five places, and then you're giving the judge an impossible task, which is to judge forms for four or six or eight hours straight. Yeah. There's no way to judge for eight hours straight. <laughs> yeah, that's also, it's sort of a thing. It's just a human, it's part of the human condition, but it's sort of a kind of the old joke where you'd have a judge, like a, a, a legal judge, who in the morning would throw the book at people. And then after they had their five martini lunch, you know, they'd start <laughs> handing out, you know, much more lenient sentences. You know, right. somebody's been judging for four hours straight or even three hours straight, you know. Their, their, their uh, quality of judging may not be as good as it was first thing in the morning. Yeah, um, I, I was asked to judge at certain tournaments because they, they implemented in, in, in the local tournaments here at Tai Chi. So, hey, we know you're the Tai Chi guy in the city here or the province. I want you to judge. And I'm thinking to myself, oh, my goodness. This, it's going to take five hours to get through seven people. This is going to be so boring. Like I said, truly, if, if it should be... Uh, we, I'm sure of those of you who've been to tournaments, um, the, the form should be limited almost. Like make a shorter form, make it a minute. It's just yeah. too much of a seven, 24 minute form, right? Or whatever it is. Yeah. It's just, it's painful. 100%. Make it one minute. 30 seconds. <laughs> we'll, we'll know the quality in 30 seconds, right? <laughs> That's right. So what about what about push hands and competitions, Chris? Like what, what can be done to change the standards there or to improve the standards, I guess? Yeah. 
Um, <clears throat> there are a couple things, all of which uh, I regard as important. The, the first I would say is that um, we need the organizations putting on these events to take them seriously. And, you know, it's, it's typically the case that a Tai Chi competition gets glued on to a general Chinese martial arts competition, which whatever the intention was, ends up being focused largely on Wushu and largely on children. And I'm actually, I'm pro Wushu and I'm pro children's involvement in martial arts, but these are strange bedfellows. And what happens is the Tai Chi guys end up in the far corner of the room. There aren't enough mats, so now you guys don't get mats. We're not starting when we were supposed to. We've been sitting around for eight hours getting cold. And uh, it's just a mess. <laughs> so if you're going to have a Tai Chi competition, please take it seriously. If you tell people there are going to be mats, you've got to have the mats. You can't get rid of the mats and then either throw people on the ground without them or just change all the rules and say, I've decided there's going to be no throws here. After people, you know, traveled across the state of the country to get here, you guys, you can't, you can't do that. You can't put a table right on the edge of the event and then say, well, don't throw them into the table. Come on, guys, get real. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I've seen all these things and much worse. Um, <clears throat> But, you know, aside from that, what I really want to see in these competitions is a rule set that people outside of Tai Chi also find interesting and that gets them a little bit fired up for a friendly competition. They say, let's go in and beat Tai Chi at Tai Chi's own game, uh, because this is the one of the ways that we stay good and get better. Yeah. That would be exciting to see. Uh, and, and I think that's... Uh... I think that's that's part of the the image problem that, that Tai Chi has, um, maybe amongst martial artists, maybe not amongst the general public. But yeah, for sure, maybe some more some better standards. Uh, you no, know, yeah, it really is the case that um, the rules can be tweaked to try to make Tai Chi look good, which is not what we want. It's not sustainable. The rules should let the best man win in, in short. And so when you say something like, well, I don't think there should be grabs in Tai Chi, therefore there's no grabs in this competition. I don't think you should have to touch somebody's legs, therefore nobody's allowed to touch anybody else's legs. This is just insanity. Uh, there's no way to become a competent martial artist when you start making up these uh, arbitrary guidelines. I saw a push hands competition in Chicago and uh, the competitors would and the judge would stop. No, I don't want to hear that sound. <laughs> so you couldn't even do that on somebody's chest. Um, Interesting. Yeah, it's difficult to have a to have a real competition under those circumstances. Um, okay, so talking about pressure testing and competition and things of that nature, uh, I wanted to ask everybody their opinions about Xu Xiaodong, the the patron saint of Tai Chi. No, just kidding. Um, so for, for people that are listening or watching that don't know, I think this was in 2007, maybe. 17? 17, right. Sorry. Yeah, 2017. Xu, Xu Dong, who's a Beijing-based uh, mixed martial artist, uh, accepted a challenge from a guy uh, who called himself uh, Lele or Wei Lei, went by both names, who said that he was a Tai Chi master. Um, I mean, he was a Tai Chi master in his own mind, I think. And that's one of the problems that you uh, run into with a lot of these people um, challenging Tai Chi masters. They're masters that nobody's ever heard of. But anyway, so Xu Xiaodong, you know, beat this guy quite viciously in, in, a, in a match uh, and it became a viral hit on the Internet. And uh, subsequently, he got challenges from other Tai Chi teachers and fought them as well. Um, Different people have different opinions about this. Some people think it's a disaster for Tai Chi. Uh, some people use it as evidence that Tai Chi doesn't work in a fight. Uh, other people thought it was good for Tai Chi. So I, I wanted to get everybody's opinion on that. And Ken, uh, why don't you uh, let me know what you think about this first? I, I salute the guy. 
I'm disappointed myself that more Chen style people haven't uh, gone in to uh, accept his challenge. <clears throat> uh, but uh, I think you should be able to defend yourself. You might not win, but you should be able to at least not have it end in eight seconds. But uh, yeah, I, I think he did us all a service. Okay, Ronnie. I am in all directions with this one. I, <laughs> it's, it's as in it, he yes, it was good he did that, but unfortunately he did it in the kind of a a disrespectful way. But after post fights, is most almost disrespectful where he's he's, he's quite belligerent. He's yelling and how oh, terrible Taiji is. You know, we could have done it in this way. Well, let's go into a room, or we'll a challenge, and bow out, right? Versus I smash you, and he's, he's quite loud and vulgar almost. And But at the same time as, yes, it was great that he did that. It kind of took away the delusion of uh, some a lot of people who thought they're good at what they do. Um, same time is that depends on what you see. Tai Chi, if, it's, if you're talking about self-defense as, as Tai Chi, you're not standing toe to toe with someone either. You're not gonna go, hey, let's fight, and you're you're a boxer, MMA guy. I'm gonna use my tai chi. It's it's it, that's why I'm on the other side of it too. It's like yes, you should be able to pressure test and test your tai chi out, but tai chi was not made to go. Let's go toe to toe right now. <laughs> Maybe you know modern day tai chi even like toe to toe, but it's good to be tested. I'm I'm that's why I'm I'm jumping back and forth here. Um, if your tai chi was you know, at, at a good state, you should be able to handle yourself like Ken says, not just get crushed. Um, but same time, um, it's very disrespectful uh, by that by his means, but it also opens people's eyes. So I, I'm on both sides. It was great that he did it, but maybe it could have done it in a more uh, more respectful way. And Tai Chi people's eyes have been open now, or internal, not only Tai Chi people, the internal, the traditional stylist, eyes have been open. If you don't mind me interjecting, I'd like to uh, if you were living in the 1800s and had been hired to help defend a village and the bandits or uh, rebels came in and you started fighting them, there's not a lot of difference between that and going toe-to-toe -to -toe with someone uh, that's going toe-to-toe -to -toe just in a more real uh, life-threatening situation. That's what right when I said that I knew. That's what I said in modern times. We're not gonna. We're not trained to go toe to toe. Yeah, I knew when I said that those words. I go, no, it was, it was made to. It's a martial art. I get it. But if if Tai Chi is is uh, in that state where we're supposed to go toe to toe and we're trained to do that, you train to do that, right? And these guys apparently haven't. The ones that tra that, that challenge that shoe, right? So, yeah, clearly. Uh Chris, what are your thoughts on Xu Zhaodong? Oh, I've got a lot. I've got a lot <laughs> to say about it. Um, first, let me say that Xu Zhaodong happened because nobody in Tai Chi was willing to do what he did. Um, so he came in as a martial arts enthusiast and wanting to, I think, create a better future for everybody, even at some level for Tai Chi, because you have to care about Tai Chi before you're even caring enough to debunk bad Tai Chi, right? So we have to acknowledge that, first of all. <clears throat> a lot of the discussion that's taken place around uh, the consequences of Xu Xiaodong has been uh, projecting, I think, fantasies about what happened. Um, so maybe we could straighten out some of those real quick before we talk more about the consequences. Um, as I understand it, it was not exactly that Xu Xiaodong uh, challenged Wei Lei. I think it was more mutual. Uh, they had a disagreement <laughs> about whether uh, Wei Lei could instantly break anybody's chokehold. Uh, Xiaodong said, no, it's not possible. Wei Lei said, of course I can do it. I'm the big master. And, uh, you know, so that escalated. <clears throat> and, you know, after that happened, some people were saying, oh, Xu Xiaodong, how could you beat up this, this weak old man? They're about the same weight, about the same age. I think maybe even 
uh, approximately the, the same uh, experience level, although doing slightly different things. Uh, so we, we can't call it bullying, although many people have tried to do that. Uh, what else have people gotten wrong about Xu Xiaodong? Um, oh, the, the idea that uh, Wei Lei was a self-proclaimed master. Actually, he was not a self-proclaimed master. Uh, some other people told him that he was a master and he went along with it. And this is something that Tai Chi people love to do. They won't say I'm a master. They say, hey, could you call me a master? Oh, look at what he said. He said I'm a master. It must, it must be true. But I'm very humble. And so, you know, the story that we've been told is really not what actually happened. But uh, in short, I agree with what Ronnie and Ken said. Look, he was telling the truth. You know, he was more right than wrong. And we all know that this needs to happen if Tai Chi is going to have a future. Otherwise, it's going to be uh, just people taking one more step, one more step towards uh, charlatanism. And it will never end. Yeah, I really think it was a pivotal moment for Tai Chi. Uh, you know, I, I think, you know, I understand why people don't like what he did or at least disagree with the way that he did it because he was very disrespectful about it. But at the same time, there were things going on. He was being attacked by the media and and, uh, and the government as well. There, there's, a, there's a whole story behind it. Um, you know, people can get into that on their own. But yeah, I think, you know, 100 years from now, people might look back at Xu Xiaodong and think, wow, you know, he really did Tai Chi World a solid favor. Um you know, returning the, the art to its roots as a martial art. Um, do you uh, guys think that Tai Chi has a public image problem now as a result of the Zhu Xiaodong incident? I think it had a public image problem long before that. Yeah. Yeah. So let me ask this. This is probably going to be close to the final question. Uh, what do you think needs to be done at this point going forward to preserve Tai Chi as a martial art for future generations? Ken, would you like to speak on that? Oh, gosh, that's a huge question. question. Um, I don't know. I think it's, it depends. You know, there are, I don't like to impose my view of Tai Chi on other people. I, there are people who teach it for fitness and health and to help elderly people move, that sort of thing. And I do too, as far as the inner calm, the centering, the philosophical aspects of things that are attached to Tai, tai Chi. And getting older, you know, the elderly part's starting to creep into, it keeps me moving, but uh, I, there has, there doesn't have to. This is a hard one. See, you start putting. Your, can I put you on the spot? You start putting your own personal biases into it, but there I just are. it's human condition, right? It was created as a tai chi. I think you can either practice part of the art or practice the entire art. Yeah. And if you do that, the entire art, there has to be some self defense. Uh, knowledge and ability and pressure testing and putting it out in public, which is why I used it in the tournaments in the Midwest. They had the image of Tai Chi as old people moving. Right. I took it into their tournaments and showed it was a martial art, plus Xing Yi and Bagua. So I think we need to do that more in the public eye. Ronnie? Yeah, of course, because stereotypically, it's, it's uh, I absolutely agree with you, Ken, with everything you just said. Um, it is a tough question. If you're doing it as a martial art, you got to train it as a martial art. And, but if you're, if, because right now the world knows MMA and talks about that as the, the, the fighting part and, and it's, it's instant gratification. You take that for three months and you're not bad, right? You take Tai Chi for 10 years, you still can, can't even stand. So as a martial art, um, if you want to train it as a martial art, you'll get, you know, as a teacher, you'll get those few students who want to train it, but you have to, you have to tell them it's going to take decades to get quite good at it, right? Like to that level, say, of course you can, you know, get good at push hands and so forth and, and, and the strategize and all that. But um, right now, most people who come, come to Tai Chi is for health, right? 
like I've tons of students come, hey, I didn't know it was a martial. As soon as I say, do this and just even just connect. Hey, 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 that's too much pressure. That's I thought it was for health. <laughs> Right, but if you really, if all, most of us here know that once you really get into the martial art part, it's, it's pretty <laughs> gritty, um, it's chaotic, right? And you, and they're trying to make it elegant. How do you turn the chaos into elegance? And that's that's what we're pursuing. Um, and it's not; it's a long game, and it's it's a journey where there's no end, right? You have to know, tell people about this that you're not going to go to a tournament and you're not going to beat up anyone, you're not going to do this or that. But in the meantime, I would say. Um, if people want to join for that, great. I'm not going to, you're not going to pull anyone in. You're not going to impose and, and, and say, Hey, you have, this is a martial art and I'm the deadliest guy there is. No, you can't say that. If people want to come, they come and it's, it's their own views, right? And we can't, we can't make people change their minds. And right now, I don't know, um, with, like I say, like Chris says with the tournaments and all that, because Tai Chi has been put into a corner. I know I've been to all these tournaments, like, there's a there's Tai Chi by the bathroom, right? <laughs> Being competing inside there, whereas watching Wushu and all these other karate things over here, breaking boards. Yeah, it's 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 we have a long road. To, if you want to do it as a martial art and make it popular as a martial art, we have a long road. Um, but us uh people here right now, if we can kind of figure out a way to evolve it to make it more popular in that sense, that's great. And I'm all for it. But right now, I'm just kind of just sitting here and just teaching and I'm enjoying it for now. Fair enough. Chris? Yeah, uh, this, is a, this is a really difficult question. Would you mind repeating the question one more time so I don't go off on too many I tangents? <laughs> yeah, I was just saying that what, what do you think needs to be done at, at this point uh, in Tai Chi's history to preserve it for future generations? Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> you know, I think I think there is a tension across all human arts at the intersection of art and commerce, uh, where you've got a certain population that is super interested in developing skills, and then you've got another population that is very skilled in uh, making money. And the people who are skilled in making money will tweak the definition of what the art is to become more successful. And then as a consequence of their actions, people will get a uh, different view of what the art really is over generations. <clears throat> and you know, this is, this is to some extent inevitable, but I think that we need, as people who really care about the art and the skills, we need to contend with people who care a little bit less about it or who would like to redefine Tai Chi for their commercial convenience. Yeah, that's a fair point. It's a good point. You know, if we can't, we can't bow out of this fight or we'll just have more Xu Xiaodongs embarrassing all of us. Yeah. You know, in the past few months, I've had a kind of an epiphany from things I've read and people I've talked to that somehow maybe some of us, including myself, have gotten off into uh, thinking if we get together or practice and do uh, the long form, Wao Zhi Yilu or the 108 and Yang, that we're doing Tai Chi. When in fact, I've become more and more enlightened to the idea that it's a collection of techniques. That's all form was to help carry the techniques forward and, and when people couldn't write or read. So I'm starting to break down the techniques in a movement, drill those so that it gives the form more meaning, more intent. And that's true in Bagua, uh, a lot of old traditional teachers taught by first you learn the individual techniques and you drill them and drill them and drill them. Then you learn how to apply those against a, an opponent, a partner, and then how to free flow with those techniques. Then you put them in the form. You learn the form at that time. It's a really interesting idea. And I'm starting to change the way I teach based on that. 
I think I think the way that you present it to the public definitely has a lot to do with obviously it has a lot to do with perception. Yeah. But I you know, I I just wanted to throw my own two cents in here, kind of step over the the line and I I I think we've we've talked about how, you know, the, the general public has this perception of Tai Chi is like Ken was saying, you know, it's like a it's a exercise for elderly people to do in the park, which it's great for. It's great for a lot of things. But you know, I when I was growing up or when I was a teenager, I, I studied a lot of Japanese martial arts with guys from Japan, grew up in Japan, went through the Japanese school system. They were required. It was mandatory that they take either judo or kendo in high school. And you had to take one. And I just thought, you know, it would be great if we had something like that in the United States. And I mean, it would be a really hard sell, uh, you know, for something like, you know, Shingy in, in, in a public school. But but I think Tai Chi is just the type of martial art that you could sort of sneak into the public school system, you know, and and by doing that, start to educate people at a very young age as just to how versatile this this art is as a martial art as a health uh you know exercise things of that nature um i, I think it, a lot of it a lot of the preservation has to do with uh getting them while they're young i guess you know get, getting people while they're young and getting them to understand what tai chi actually is you know, just don't show the yin yang symbol because when my daughter was in eighth grade they accused her of being satanic the satanist oh, yeah that's, 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 that's how they get you <laughs> Yeah, that's that's a that's a story for another time. But yeah. <laughs> so does anybody have any closing words here before before we wrap things up? I think we touched on some pretty good subjects here. Nobody nobody got their feelings hurt. Nobody got a black eye or anything like that. <laughs> well, then we're really not done, are we? Yeah. <laughs> we have, yeah. we'll, we'll, we'll definitely do it again. So, yeah, and I was going to say to all of you guys, you know, if you, uh, if you want to do this again and you think of some, some think of some topics that we didn't get to touch on or didn't get deep enough into, you know, please let me know and we will definitely do another round of this because I certainly enjoyed it. I hope you guys did too. It was great hearing. I did too. I'd love to explore more of the similarities and differences between say young style and chin style sometimes. That that's actually would be a like an entire discussion by itself. But yeah. 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 I'm interested in that too. That'd be really good. All right. Well yeah, we'll do it again then. Uh, guys, uh, thanks very much. And, um, you know, I'll put links to all of your schools and, and platforms in the description for this video, and I'll let you know before it airs and everything. Okay. Good thanks. to meet you, Chris. Thank you so much. See you, Ron. Thank you. All right. Thanks a lot, guys. Thank you, Bill. You.